Welcome to everybody on this uh, Saturday afternoon. As in this context, uh, I'm not known to everybody, I think. Uh, I should say that my name is Helmut and I'm the director of the Goethe Institute or the Max Müller Bauern. I have been here for three and a half years. My role today is just to give a brief uh, welcome as the host, uh, but as always, I like to add two or three phrases or thoughts, and they will be very uh, short. Uh, we get a lot of calls and mails and things, people who want to use the auditorium or have projects, etc. And not always you are completely happy about what you get and you have to say no quite long, uh, quite often. And then these wonderful things happen where somebody calls you or writes you in this case, in this case CAG, asking whether it may be possible to do this wonderful event today here in the Goethe Institute. And you are immediately enthusiastic and say, yes, this is exactly what I want. So why should I want this? <clears throat> CAG is a very influential group in Chennai, that's what you all know. But that is one important reason. But there are other influential groups in Chennai, and I don't know if always I would be so happy to have them here. No, the basic thing is, it has to fit into the philosophy and the contents of the work that you do in your institute. Um, and we try to, apart from the merely artistic and linguistic, the language department uh, point of view, we try to concentrate and commit ourselves in socially relevant uh, things in town. And uh, apart from ecology and other topics, I think we have uh, done quite a lot of uh, events that have to do with social equality and these questions. So, and then, of course, uh, to have a wonderful big name, I don't think that I really want to put it like that, you have that big name, but that's not really what I mean, but such an influential uh, person who has to say such a lot of things about what happens in the world in India at the moment. So that's really wonderful. So I'm very happy about this collaboration today with CAG. I hope that many others will follow and I'm very uh, happy, Mr. Harsh Manda, to have you with us today. Thanks very much for this opportunity. Thanks very much to all of you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. Mr. Harsh Manda, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening. I am Saroja, and on behalf of the board and staff of CAG, I take great pleasure in welcoming you all to our Founders Day lecture. CAG was founded in 1985 by a group of highly respected Chennai residents, including the late Mr. S. Govind Swaminathan, former Advocate General of Tamil Nadu, late Mr. S. Guhan, former Finance Secretary, Government of Tamil Nadu, Mr. S. L. Rao, former Chairman, Central Electricity Regulatory Commission, and Mr. Sriram Panchu, Senior Advocate. Issues affecting the common citizen in areas of consumer protection, urban governance, and the environment are priorities in the work undertaken by CAG, and the focus has always been on enhancing participatory spaces for the public. The key approaches used by CAG to execute its vision are 1. Research and clear understanding of issues 2. Education and awareness programs for informed public interaction with government agencies and three, campaigns, advocacy, and representation on various, various issues that impact citizens. Beginning 1985, CAG has kept pace with the new challenges arising for consumers, from basic problems relating to defective goods and services, to investor protection, power and telecom sector reforms, 
methods to control the unethical promotional practices adopted by pharma companies that have a direct impact on drug costs, sustainable consumption and development, ill effects of junk food, misleading advertisements, monitoring the growth of e-commerce and so on. We assist in the setting of service delivery standards across various sectors in India. Since inception, our complaints desk has been providing free legal guidance to consumers. In the area of urban governance, our activities have ranged from campaigning for greater access to information, monitoring the functioning of public utilities and advocating for greater transparency and accountability in governmental and private sector functioning, to decentralized and localized urban planning, protection of water bodies, open spaces and our heritage. We have also filed a number of public interest litigations seeking the intervention of the legal system for improved governance. Presently, we harness new technologies to promote good governance. We also work extensively on solid waste management. The work centers on research and promotion of sustainable and inclusive solid waste management in Chennai. It is aimed at filling gaps in knowledge and understanding about waste, its management and the actors involved through both qualitative and quantitative research. Besides, CAG has been working on environmental issues like water management and protection of natural resources and has been actively involved in empowering the local communities in South India on the environmental impact assessment process. CAG's patient engagement with diverse issues sometimes over decades, has led to continued and sustained impacts. While go good governance and citizen empowerment have been on the agenda of governments and civil societies alike, much is yet to be achieved. We are building on our more than three decades of history to step boldly into the future. With a passionate team, strong and professional leadership within the organization, a powerful and committed board of trustees and advisors, and support from Indian and globally reputed philanthropic organizations, we are now poised to deepen both our expertise and the impact of our efforts. Thank you. I now invite uh, Dr. Ram Manohar Reddy to introduce the speaker for today. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Saroja. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to see a full hall to listen to uh, Mr. Harsh Mandir, who I think all of you know, um, know her. Uh, for those of you who don't know of him, let me say a few words about uh, him and his work. Formally, he is the director of the Equity Studies in Delhi, uh, which does research and conducts campaigns, as its title suggests, in the field of equity. Uh, the center also produces every year the India Exclusion Report, which looks at various aspects of exclusion of uh, India's marginalized. Uh, but besides that, he is many things, you know, he is not one to be found behind the table. Most recently, he did this Yatra from uh, Assam in the East, a village in Assam in the East and went through various villages and towns where there were incidents of uh, violence, communal violence. And the Yatra ended in uh, Porbandar, you know, as a city of hope, uh, on October 2nd. Uh, that's most recent. He has been involved in various campaigns. There was the Aman Biradari campaign and then later uh, Nyayagra in, for, for the justice and reconciliation. And officially he has been uh, special commissioner for the Supreme Court, the right to food. So I can go on and on. And he was um, in the IAS for I think more than 20 years until he quit in 2002 after the communal violence in Gujarat. I have known him, I mean, I wish I could I have known him, wish I had known him well enough to call him a friend, uh, but he has been an acquaintance, friend, and a kind of colleague. I first got to know of him, I know of him before I met him in the early 80s through common friends who spoke about this very intelligent, idealistic person who had joined the IAS. 
So there was a legend and myth built around Hatch even before I met. And in some ways it was uh, confirmed. I first met him in the late 80s when I was very, very peripherally involved in the um, anti-Narmada movement. And Hatch was in the service in Madhya Pradesh. And I saw him not with respect to the Narmada Sagar, but I saw how he worked with people around him. And it showed that this was not a bureaucrat. You know? And he, of course, because of his idealism and uh, his commitment, he was transferred, I don't know how many times, dozen times or 15 times, I and mean, that doesn't matter. But what matters more is what I've heard about how he worked in the districts when, when he did. Uh, he did, uh, I mean, I was in touch with him off and on through common friends, as I said, and then, and then after February 2002, when I was in Chennai at that time, and then we were sort of playing about, you know, what could we do sitting here, and I heard that he had got involved in some measures of uh, relief, so that was the second set of uh, interactions with him, uh, and then he, if I'm not mistaken, he was with Oxfam uh, at that time trying to work in the field of uh, rehabilitation in Gujarat. And that's when he quit the IAS to kind of uh, set up uh, various campaigns uh, to work in the field of rehabilitation and then with the homeless street, uh, people who live on the street. Uh, there is another side of Hush that I would like to share with you and that is, I've also been his editor you know, and I was the editor of Economic and Political Weekly. I had a pleasure of publishing many of his articles and he has a way of writing simple, direct and at the same time conveying poignancy, despair and also hope. Mm -hmm. um, even today, more than a decade later, two articles are in my mind, you know, if uh, those of you are interested. There was one article in 2005 or six. he wrote on, you know, we know a lot about campaigns against uh, displacement, uh, campaigns against eviction, but we don't know much about what happens to the people after they are displaced, what kind of lives they lead, what kind of hopes they have. And he wrote this very moving essay in 2005, I think, about those who were displaced from the town of Harsud uh, from the uh, Indra Sagar project. And then again in 2012, there was an, uh, 2012, there was another article which uh, I can recall very easily. Um, it was one which he wrote about the struggle for justice among the survivors of Gujarat. By, I mean, he was involved in those struggles, but what he conveys is not just, not just a hopelessness, but the whole process through which people try to come to terms with their the injustice done to them, then how they go to court, uh, what support they need to go to court, and then also about what it means for them to forgive. But forgive in a certain situation which is not born out of justice, but what circumstances drive them to uh, seek forgiveness. These are two very uh, moving pieces that uh, come to my mind, as I said, I've been as uh, editor as well and not just a, a friend and an acquaintance. Uh, so he has, you know, he also has a column in the Hindu, I mean, some of you may have read that. So he's really a man of many parts, but also at this point, he's very, very concerned about what's happened in our uh, society, uh, in politics in a very broad sense, not in a narrow sense. And as the title of this talk says, it's the challenges to our constitutional values at this time and what we can do about it. Uh, Harsh, I'm very pleased that you accepted our invitation to come and give this lecture in spite of what must be a very busy uh, schedule. Um, thank you. Distinguished guests. Uh, my gratitude uh, for your generous words, Ram, and uh, to all of you for gathering here. Uh, I'm sure there are better ways of spending a Saturday afternoon. Um, it's a privilege to be 
here on the 32nd anniversary of the founding of the Citizen Consumer and Civil Action Group in Chennai. Uh, but let me talk about what is uppermost in my mind and heart for the last months, years. We live in very troubled times. Uh, I believe there are moments in history when later generations will ask, what did you do at that time? And I think we are passing through one such moment in history. Uh, there are many, many aspects, and this is not just about India. I see this happening around the world. There's a rising tide of hate and bigotry. Uh, the failures of the economy to deliver opportunities of decent work uh, to millions of young people. Uh, there's the erosion of public institutions. Uh, there's the crisis of climate change. Uh, but overwhelmingly, uh, we're seeing, we're losing our planet in some ways. But I think most importantly, we're seeing a tearing apart of the social fabric in country after country around the world. We are seeing the rise of leaders elected by significant sections of, of the electorate in country after country. In some, like France or Germany recently, uh, uh, they may not have won power, but they made a bid and a convincing bid for power. But in other countries, um, most recently the United States, and in, in several others, and India as well, we've seen the rise of a new leadership, uh, which some people describe as a populist leadership. There are three or four characteristics of this of this new leadership that I want to talk about, and the kinds of challenges they they pose to uh, what I describe as our constitutional values. The first of them is that, that these are leaders who, in their very, uh, in their politics, in their personalities, uh, represent and reflect highly divided societies. Uh, but instead of being leaders who heal or bridge divides, these are leaders who, who revel in those divisions and who foster and deepen those divisions in society. These are leaders who reflect, amplify, and most importantly, legitimize hatred and bigotry in society. And this is, this I think, is the most overwhelming challenge of our time. Uh, because these are elected leaders, uh, the important thing is, is, is not simply uh, the personalities of these leaders. I think that is, uh, you know, that, uh, that's not what is significant. What is significant is these are leaders who are being chosen by significant sections of people across the world. A second characteristic of this new leadership is what I describe uh, somewhere as a, as a peculiar kind of moral inversion. And let me explain. In this moral inversion, you know, we traditionally looked at oppressed people and oppressing or dominant or hegemonic groups. Uh, and, and what these leaders are doing is actually turning this on their heads. Because it is the dominant group which is now presented as the persecuted group. And the persecuted group is being portrayed as the oppressing group. Uh, let me explain. So in the United States, States, it is the white Americans who are being persecuted by people of color, by minorities, by, uh, by religious minorities, uh, by immigrants. Uh, in India, again, the idea is that like America is 
is being portrayed as a country that belongs to the white people but is being taken away by these illegitimate interlopers. Likewise, India is portrayed as a country of the Hindu uh, majority, upper caste Hindu majority. And in many ways, the male upper caste Hindu majority represent true Indianness. And this country that belongs to them is being taken away uh, by, once again, by religious minorities, uh, Muslims, Christians, foreign religions, and by the growing assertion of disadvantaged uh, caste people. Uh, this model inversion actually extends also to economics. So, so what we, we are being told is that uh, it is, you know, it is the rich and the middle class who work hard, who, who uh, you know, earn their money, uh, they create wealth, they pay taxes, and these taxes are being scrounged away by uh, by poor people who, who you know who, who are just hanging around waiting for uh, subsidies and and support and and so on. So you uh, so somebody like me who was you know, worked on the Food Security Act is accused as some of, of as somebody who is sort of trying to distribute our money. Uh, somebody in you know one of the debates when the Food Security Security Act was being debated in Parliament. I since I was responsible for the, I was on the working group in the National Advisory Council which drafted the the Act. Uh, I found myself in front of television cameras day after day where everybody, including the anchor. And not just the anchor that you are thinking about. Everybody was angry, uh, and uh, and, and in, in one of the discussions, uh, one normally level-headed uh, industrialist, uh, uh, she uh, she turned to me and said, "You know, what's wrong with the fact that I've made my money? I've made money because I worked hard. Um, I've done nothing to harm the economy. Why should I be taxed to feed the poor?" Uh, and, and you know, I, that's a, that's that's an observation that has stayed with me because, to my mind, like the rising climate of food, there is also this sense of the privilege has become entitlement, and those who are disadvantaged uh, deserve the disadvantage, and social and political orders which have an imagination of redistribution are, in some sense taking away the legitimate uh, resources earned by the merit of people who start off with privilege. And in this complicated way, once again the poor uh, become not the persecuted or the oppressed, but the persecuting, the parasitical. Uh, you know, in, the, in the US, I often hear this talk about you know, there are two kinds of Americans, they are the givers and the takers. All of which, I mean, none of this has any empirical reality to uh, any uh, real, authentic relation with uh, what is truly happening. But these are leaders who, as I said, are promoting a discourse of a morally inverted discourse where I can be both the dominant group and enjoy the anger of, of, of feeling oppressed, which frees me of any responsibility to the person who is suffering uh, disadvantage, uh, discrimination and want. A third characteristic of these new leaders that we are throwing up is an extraordinary decline in the civility of public discourse, just, just the quality of how you treat your opponent. I mean, I Sometimes, you know, uh, uh, our Prime Minister is considered by many people uh, a great orator. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a biased observer. I don't agree with his politics. But, uh, but even if I try to listen objectively, I don't find anything attractive about a style of discourse which is primarily one of hectoring your opponent. Uh, but it's much more dramatic in, 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 in somebody like Mr. Trump where the moment somebody disagrees with him, he's a, she's a loser or she's a something, a failed actress or 
uh, fake or something or the other, you know. And and I think about a young person who would be looking at these people as role models, and how would they learn about how do you how do you disagree with civility? And I think we've lost that as well. And uh, you know, along with the other things, I'm really placing this quite high up in my concerns about the climate that we are living in. And finally, these leaders represent an extraordinary intolerance with dissent, uh, with disagreement. Uh, they are absolutely free from self-doubt. Uh, they do not accept that there is a legitimate alternative point of view. Uh, and and we're seeing a kind of climate in which the supreme leader, the government, the party, and the country are all converged into one. And any disagreement uh, with a specific policy, uh, even, is portrayed very quickly as being against the nation. Anti-national, unpatriotic. And this is increasingly silencing voices of disagreement. Uh, we are seeing a time when, you know, that, that famous, uh, you know, report of the IB, which should have been, which would be hilarious if it, it wasn't, you know, uh, so serious, where, which actually said that people who disagree with the development model of the times, which is largely market-led uh, growth, uh, uh, they would be disagreeing on environmental grounds, on grounds of labor, uh, labor rights, on, on grounds of land acquisition and, uh, and justice. So we are being told that people who disagree with the, and oppose uh, India's growth model are actually uh, cost the country 2% of GDP growth. And, and we are living in times where, where uh, God Almighty is GDP growth, and anybody who's sort of uh, uh, allegedly acting against it is is committing the ultimate blasphemy, uh, and is 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 the most unpatriotic of people. And so, somebody like me uh, is is often described as a Maoist, and and I find that hilarious. Uh, uh, um, at the very highest level, I've been described as a Maoist. And uh, I happen to be extremely opposed to all forms of violence, including uh, uh, extreme left violence, uh, and, and and so on. But but in in this imagination, anybody who is opposed even to the economic model of the times is is against the nation. Uh, and and the suppression of of dissent uh, has become something that. You know, over the last three years in India, uh, I'm amazed at the degree to which self-censorship has been accepted without resistance by most of the mainstream media, by most of civil society, by by large segments of the intellectual world, where we are very careful about uh, what we say, what we oppose, uh, uh, and you know, I, I I write columns uh, in, in in some newspapers uh, and and the editors, uh, some have pulled me off, but some say that, Harsh, we're trying so hard to hold on to you and you don't make it easy. And I say, but that's not my job. Uh, and and I find that they, they say that we can, you know, be like, I won't change what I'll write. So, uh, so increasingly my pieces are rejected uh, on, on the ground that, that they are seen as even sort of mildly critical uh, of uh, people uh, in authority. And so uh, we see that, but I'm seeing increasingly what I uh, view as a, as a growing kind of self-censorship. People are not telling you, uh, people lean on you, but we actually have people, you know, the PMO has rung up and said, we don't want this story. I'll be speaking about the Karwane Mohabbat, but uh, uh, which we took out. Something as sort of uh, as uh, unthreatening as as the caravan of love, or it perhaps was very threatening, but that you actually have uh, officials uh, ringing up 
newspapers and saying we don't want this, any story to be carried and, and that they comply with it. Uh, that we don't want discussions about lynching in the in the mainstream press and, and people comply with it. Uh, a leading national paper had actually carried, a, you know, had just about seven or eight articles uh, in a series which said, let's talk about hate. Uh, I was also invited to contribute one of the articles. And uh, the editor-in-chief was sacked and the national hate crime tracker that they had set up was pulled off uh, and so on. So I, uh, so what I'm talking about this, this, this new leadership, which I feel is deeply uh, threatening uh, to everything that we hold precious in uh, in a democratic republic, in a modern secular democratic republic. Uh, so leaders that amplify and legitimize bigotry and prejudice, leaders that morally invert the oppressor and the oppressed, uh, le leaders which reflect more and more a falling of the quality and civility of this uh, public discourse, and a leadership which is uh, openly uh, intolerant and suppressive of dissenting viewpoints. Together these, and I will mostly talk about India, together these represent a massive threat, possibly unprecedented. The emergency is, is of course a competing moment, but the emergency threatened many freedoms, but it still didn't threaten the social fabric in the way uh, that we see today. So arguably, uh, we, are, we are facing moments of, of highest threat to India's constitutional values. What are these values? What are the four pillars and what are the threats that we see? One of them is justice. The second, them, second of them as laid out in the preamble that we the people give to we the people. So justice, liberty, equality and fraternity. Uh, I'll spend a larger part of my discussion talking about the fourth which we speak about and we understand the least, which is fraternity. Uh, but let me briefly first talk about justice, equality and liberty and the threats to them in the times that we live in. Uh, and I speak of them, each of them, uh, illustrating the threats with, with some example. Because in, in, in the brief time that we have to discuss, I'll just throw out example, the threats to justice, firstly. Um, in Bhopal last winter, we suddenly got this news that eight uh, terrorists uh, tried to escape the jail uh, and were caught and shot down. I went there two days later uh, and, and the story that emerged was so extraordinary uh, and the fact that it has passed, has been allowed to pass. So we are told that these were, these were not confirmed terrorists, they were still under trial, uh, charged with, uh, under, uh, as being members of the Sunni. But they were in a high security jail, which is, you know, like it's like a box in a box in a box. So you're here and then there, there are walls here and there are walls here and there are walls here. Uh, so we are told that, that one evening they escaped. So the question was, how did they escape? So we were told that they were escaped by making keys out of their toothbrushes. And this is the official version. Toothbrushes. Uh, uh, help them get out of the security prison. That evening, by coincidence, every CCTV was not working. Uh, almost every senior officer was, was not on duty. Then, how did they climb the walls? So we were told, we are told that they were they climbed the walls uh, by tying up 35, 40 bed sheets. 
Now, anyone who works with prisons knows that uh, you do not give, I mean, they, they, they do not give prisoners even a single bed sheet for fear of them hanging themselves. These are high security prisoners. And even if they had a mis made a mistake and gave them one sheet, uh, how did they get 35 sheets uh, to tie up together and build this thing? And how did they climb up the walls? Then there was supposed to be one elderly guard who was there uh, who was killed by a knife that was fashioned out of a spoon, we are told. So this one guard was killed uh, with a spoon. And finally, these eight men are said to have escaped from, from the jail. Now, if you escape, you would imagine that people would disperse. Instead, what we find is that, what we were told is that through the night, they stayed together. Somebody apparently met them, uh, gave them new clothes, uh, uh, and uh, they, they, had, they were wearing jeans, they were wearing other clothes, etc. But instead of uh, dispersing in the night in separate, they stayed together, they didn't travel very far, so they went about uh, three or four kilometers distant. And when they were found the next morning by the police, they were on this ledge and I'd gone to that, there was a, there's a protruding uh, portion of the, uh, of the, uh, of, of a kind of a cliff, uh, where three ways, if they went anywhere, they would just fall down the cliff. And they were trapped in that, and uh, and then they were shot down. Uh, even if they had wanted to catch them alive, the, it was entirely feasible because there was nowhere they could go. And when I reached there two days later, the blood stains were all over the uh, uh, the cliff, but uh, the, the police hadn't even cordoned it off. So the uh, so there was a deliberate destruction of all evidence. And so, what seems so worryingly a, a clear case of, of extrajudicial killing, uh, criminalized extrajudicial killing. So when some of us raised the issue, the chief minister uh, very angrily said, what do you expect me to do with terrorists? Feed them biryani. Uh, and there the matter rests. Uh, during the, uh, since Mr. Yud, uh, Aditya Nath became chief minister, uh, of, of Uttar Pradesh. It's important to remember that Mr. Aditya Nath is, is the person who founded a private militia of, of, uh, of Hindu young men, uh, which has not been disbanded. Uh, it continues to function and he's well known for many forms of, 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 of hate speech, all of which is culpable. But one of the things that, again, hardly has, has impressed itself on the public conscience is that uh, BBC reported, based on an official public report that they issued, that they have been, there were 433 encounters, extrajudicial encounters uh, in UP from March to October this year, which means one encounter every 12 hours. As we pass, uh, when we were, when I go to UP on the front pages, you'll always find these pictures. Ke badmash ko mara gaya. and uh, they they always Muslim, they always caught, and if they're not killed, then they uh, what this, there's a peculiar kind of shooting which they do, which is keeping their legs uh, together, and then you shoot them through the knee, or shoot them through the ankle, uh, so that they become disabled for life, and this is not being questioned at all. So I'm, you know, so, so the first, I'm just giving a couple of illustrations about how our ideas of what is just, and and there can be many discussions. I, in fact, wrote a recent long essay in the Economic Political Weekly about this idea of, you know, that in the name of terror laws, we have accepted that it is legitimate to dilute. Uh, standards of protection uh, which other accused persons have on the notion that there's a utilitarian philosophical idea that for the greater good of all of us it is legitimate to take away uh, freedoms of, of some people but the consequences are now 
becoming obvious where, where we're finding innocent people who are finally declared innocent are emerging from jails now. Sometimes after spending 14 years, sometimes after spending 23 years of their lives in jail, uh, often without a single day's parole. Uh, I uh, have got to know very well a, 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 a young, not a young man any longer, a middle-aged man called Amir, who uh, was picked up at the age of 18 when he was uh, uh, in the name of the Bombay bomb, uh, the Delhi blasts. And a number of charges were, and he was tortured, he was kept in jail, and he, you know, his family got destroyed, there was uh, very poor people. His father died in two or three years, his mother, who never stepped out of the home, tried to fight his cases alone for many, many years. It took 14 years, and he finally emerged, and he, you know, he, he's written a very beautiful book with Nandita Haksar, uh, uh, Tamed as a Terrorist. Uh, I'd recommend it to each of you who care about um, India is a human, humane republic, uh, not just a just republic, uh, to read it. Uh, you know, the whole world had changed in those, you know, from the time he went in in 1998. When he came out, he didn't know what internet was, he didn't know, uh, you know, what emails were, he didn't know that people shopped in malls, he didn't know that television could have multiple channels. You know, he, the world had passed him by. And then now you tell him that he's completely innocent. But he's such an extraordinary person because he still talks about uh, how how much he believes in uh, India's secular democracy. Uh, he often says that uh, Muslims are, are Indian not by chance but by choice and my uh, grandparents made a choice uh, to stay on in India and I think even today after all that has happened to me that they made the right choice. Um, anyway, so so these are some illustrations of, of, of my worries about what is happening with justice. Uh, equality. Uh, little over a year ago, uh, a, a doctoral scholar in a university, a central university uh, in Hyderabad, took his life, uh, Rohit Vanilla. And the letter he left behind, uh, his first and last letter to the world, is, is to my mind one of the most powerful, moving indictments of what we are or have become as a nation, or have not become as a nation. He said, I could not escape the fatal accident of my birth. And I think, in many ways, it is a reminder that almost every one of us in this room uh, are probably not here, including myself, uh, because we deserve to be here. We are here because a billion people in this country did not get the life chances uh, that we had. We are here because of the accident of our birth. And that we have continued to be a country where the accident of your birth, fatal or, or, or glorious, uh, will determine everything else about your life, whether you'll survive at all, whether you'll get enough nutrition, whether you'll have an education, what kind of education you'll have, whether you'll have clean water, whether you'll have access to health care, how long you'll be able to live, what jobs are open to you, what possibilities are open to you, are not determined uh, by the metal of your character, by by this, how steely is your, your, your resolve, how hard you work, not resolved by the plight of your dreams, it's resolved only primarily still by the accident of your birth. And I don't really need to say more about equality, although again I could spend several hours. Uh, we are growing into a more and more unequal society over the last 25 years uh, since globalization. Uh, India had started off with two dollar billionaires uh, in 1991. Today we have the third largest population of dollar billionaires in the world. But we still, we are also a country which has, uh, in which every third child is malnourished. Uh, every third malnourished child in the world is also Indian. 
जस्टिस इक्वालिटी लिबर्टी फ्रीडम आजादी फ्रीडम फ्रॉम वॉट कन्हैया कुमार इन हिज इन हिज स्पीच इज कीप टॉकिंग अबाउट आजादी आजादी फ्रॉम दिस आजादी फ्रॉम दैट बट मच बिफोर हम प्रेजिडेंट रूजवेल्ट इन द यू एस है टॉक्ट अबाउट फॉर फ्रीडम एंड दैट माइट बी वन वे ऑफ थिंकिंग अबाउट फ्रीडम ही टॉक अबाउट द फ्रीडम ऑफ वर्शिप फ्रीडम फ्रॉम वॉन्ट फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच एंड एक्सप्रेशन एंड फ्रीडम फ्रॉम फियर लेट स्टार्ट विद द फ्रीडम ऑफ वर्शिप इन द सर्कमस्टांसिस ऑफ इंडियाज Uh, freedom struggle and uh, and uh, partition and the violence that happened uh, uh, our founding fathers and mothers took great care to defend very strongly in multiple ways in the constitution the freedom of worship the freedom of conscience the freedom to follow uh, the freedom to follow Uh, your beliefs and not just to follow them but to propagate them but instead we have a campaign uh, two campaigns today one is the campaign of ghar wapsi the others of love jihad which along with the third campaign uh, uh, for cow protection uh, has completely taken away uh, the freedom of worship that was guaranteed to us in the constitution uh, firstly what is ghar wapsi ghar wapsi literally means home coming which then means that home is actually the hindu faith and those who have in in, in search of greater equality uh, converted to is- islam or christianity have strayed away they are prodigals who have to be brought back home And so this is a campaign to bring people back home uh, the anti conversion laws i think quite clearly violate uh, the letter of the constitution uh, and even more so the spirit uh, but they have now 99% of india actually uh, you know you, you're seeing where these laws are are, are grown 99% of india has was uh, cow slaughter laws which again violate uh, the idea of the freedom uh, of worship but coming back to anti conversion laws uh, these are laws that criminalize uh, conversion by inducement or uh, what is called inducement or uh, uh, or uh, intimidation and inducement and intimidation are also said to include uh, divine consequences uh, that are supposed to follow from one belief or another uh, and so this there's a there's a sense uh, wherever especially in tribal areas where uh, uh, the very small community of christian people are increasingly made to feel a sense of fear uh, the idea that that india will be threatened if more and more people convert to christianity or to islam is an idea that we should interrogate much more than than it should than we do uh with muslims the idea is that they are trying to expand their numbers in two ways one by irresponsible uh, breeding uh, of uh, of large large families and the other is by the idea of love jihad the idea uh an extraordinarily fanciful idea that good looking muslim men are, are somehow picked up and trained in madrasas to uh, attract hindu girls who apparently have nothing in their heads and you know they just and you need to ap- apparently have motorcycles and and uh, mobile phones and some kind of deodorants and so on that would uh, attract uh, hindu girls uh mindlessly who would who don't i mean 
again, it would be a, a completely absurd idea if it was not such a dangerous idea, which was actually taken, uh, you know, uh, settled and convinced seg large segments of, of people. And with Christians, it is this that they are uh, that they are going to add to their numbers by uh, by all of these devious uh, uh, Christian missionaries who are funded by uh, by Rome and by all sorts of people across the world. Uh, as it happens, factually, the percentage of Christians in India was two point five percent, and has not increased. In fact, it's fallen a little bit. So if all of this conversion was happening, then you'd have much larger numbers of Christian people. And with Muslims, if you compare social and economic class, Muslim and Hindu, uh, and size of family, you find absolutely similar sizes of family. And as Muslims uh, are, are so large families among Muslims is only representative of the fact that there is much greater poverty and social deprivation. And they Reproductive behavior is, is, is almost identical to people of any other community of the same social class. Um, but having said that, the idea that India would be threatened if indeed more people were becoming Christian or, or Muslim is something that I, I think we need to uh, worry about that assumption. And I don't think we do enough. Apurvanan, uh, a very dear friend of mine, wrote this article uh, where he was saying that, think of being a Muslim, where every new child who is born as a Muslim is not seen as a moment of celebration, but one of threat to the rest of the community. That look, another Muslim has been born, uh, you know, things are dangerous for us here. So the freedom of worship, uh, and then of course the anti uh, cow slaughter laws, and here, as I said, 99% of India today is living under in states where there's some kind of uh, anti-cow slaughter law. Uh, and many of these have been passed in Congress regimes. Uh, in fact, Sampurnanan, the first chief minister in, in, in uh, Uttar Pradesh and President uh, Rajendra Prasad, were people who took up the matter very strongly with Nehru at that time, saying that there should be a national law banning cow slaughter. And Nehru was supposed to have dismissed it as calling it as utter nonsense and uh, progressive and so on. But despite that, Uttar Pradesh did pass an anti cow slaughter law in 1955, and one by one we've been seeing uh, these laws coming up. It's just that when the BJP has come to power, dormant laws or rarely enforced laws are being both enforced but also backed by uh, vigilante uh, activism. And so the anti-conversion laws and the uh, cow slaughter laws have now amounted very much to create a situation like the blasphemy laws in, uh, in Pakistan, where minorities are con in continuous threat uh, uh, both of, of criminal action and of violent retribution uh, simply because of their identity as Muslims and Christians. Uh, freedom from want, uh, we can have a very long discussion about that, uh, but I'll just say uh, a recent report uh, about India's position in the Global Hunger Index uh, showed that we were at a proud position of being 100 uh, out of 119 countries in the world. In Asia, uh, India's performance on the Global Hunger Index is now we are the bottom three uh, countries in Asia. The only countries worse off than us today in Asia are Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, Bangladesh, which has half India's per capita income, even Nepal, which is much poorer and has also emerged from 15 years of of uh, civil war, countries in sub-Saharan Africa, all across have uh, have been able to end or substantially end hunger or substantially reduce it. Uh, the paradox that India today is still unable to end the tragedy of 
people having to live with hunger and to sleep hungry. It's a monumental one. Uh, India is the fastest growing economy in the world and we are proud of that. Uh, India has sometimes 70 million tons of grain in government warehouses. Uh, 70 million tons doesn't make sense to many of us. Uh, my, my friend Ron Drez once had explained to me that 70 million tons means if you put one sack of grain next to the other in a line, you can go from the earth to the moon, you can come back and you can go around the world a couple of times. Uh, that much grain we have in our warehouses, yet 200 million people sleep hungry, yet every third child in India is malnourished, and we don't seem to be able to reverse it. Uh, Akhil Gupta is, is an, 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 an anthropologist in UPLA. He asked a question, how many people die in India of completely preventable causes? Uh, just simply because uh, they don't have food or healthcare or clean water. And he came up with a conservative figure of 2 million. Uh, if you, you know, just to put that figure in perspective, the number of people who died in the Great Bengal Famine of, of, uh, of 1943 was about 3 million. So what we are saying is that something like the Great Bengal Famine is happening in our midst year after year after year and we don't even notice. Occasionally, uh, we had the story of Santoshi uh, in, in Jharkhand and the utterly heartbreaking story of a mother telling, uh, telling them that the eight days there was not a single grain of rice in our house, there was no work and my child kept saying bhat bhat and she died saying bhat bhat. As Supreme Court Commissioner on the right to food, uh, bhat is rice. Uh, I uh, investigated a very large number of starvation deaths and after along with hate crime and homelessness, uh, hunger is what I work on a lot. And, and, and the enormity of the suffering of a parent who cannot feed her, her or his child. I remember this set of Masahar uh, mothers who were actually telling me that the most painful lesson of all, and I often talk about this, is, is this lesson of how to teach, to teach your child how to sleep hungry. That there will be 5, 10, 15 days in a month maybe when I can't feed you. And you simply have to learn how to sleep hungry. And for me, when we talk about the freedom from want, uh, how this was, this would be intolerable at any time of history. But today, when we have such you know, unprecedented levels of wealth around us, when we have so much food that we don't know what to do with it, for today to continue to have children who to sleep and hungry and die of hunger, a malnourished child, one third of the children being malnourished means that their brains and bodies are not allowed to form to full potential. Uh, simply because we don't have adequate nutrition. It should be something that is intolerable to us, but it is not. Uh, I'm talking about four freedoms, freedom from worship, freedom of worship, freedom from want, freedom of speech and expression and dissent. And I need not uh, speak longer about that. But this, I already spoke about this climate of, of fear to speak out and of self-censorship. Uh, I'll tell you a somewhat uh, funny uh, anecdote. Uh, there's uh, this one of the great things I think that Mr. Modi has gifted us, uh, to which I'll be eternally grateful, is, is a great sense of parody and humor uh, on the internet. Uh, I, you see a great amount of, of you know, stand up comedians and, and, and humor, etc. So there's this one person called Varun Grover who uh, does uh, stand-up comedy uh, lampooning uh, Mr. Modi very effectively uh, on uh, on the internet. In one of his programs, he ends up by saying, you know, whenever I make do a program like this, people come to me and say, Varun, you're very brave. He says the thing that strikes me is that for ten years before Mr. Modi came to power, I used to do even, you know, even more. Uh, extravagant uh, lampooning of 
Manmohan Singh and uh, and Rahul Gandhi, people then used to come to me and say, you're very funny. But nobody ever came and said to me, you're very brave. And I think that, you know, th there's a great sort of uh, lesson in, 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 in that anecdote. And lastly, the freedom from fear. Uh, and what set me off, and, and that will actually bring me to the central point that I want to bring is, is that where is justice, equality, liberty, all are under massive threat. What is most under threat today is the idea of fraternity. Uh, I went across India whenever I travel, particularly Muslim uh, brothers and sisters in every corner of the country, of every social class, speak about how they have started living with fear, with everyday fear. And to me, if we allow that to happen unchallenged, we have lost the idea of India. We've lost everything that is precious about India. If this is a country where, where people of a particular identity feel they can only live here uh, with a continuous sense of fear. Uh, and, and lynching, you have to understand how this phenomenon of lynching has so successfully created this climate of fear. After all, we have had, this is not the first time there is communal violence. We've had much larger episodes of communal violence. The biggest of all was the 1984 attacks on six and the series uh, you know, uh, like Nelly uh, in 1983, uh, Bhagalpur in 1989, Bombay in 1992, 93, Gujarat in 2002 were large massacres, anti-minority massacres. Why, what is it that lynching has done which is different? Communal violence, however large it is, is still bound somewhere by geography and by time. Like it happens in a particular area, it has a beginning, it has an end, uh, and things slowly sort of settle down. But with lynching, the message is very different. With lynching, the message is that if you belong to that particular identity, you're not safe anywhere now. You're not safe in your own home. You're not safe when you're traveling on a train. You're not safe when you're walking to work. You're not safe in a public place. And it is that sense of fear that is communicated through uh, this epidemic of, of lynching uh, that has broken out in many parts of India that have you know that have been the antithesis of this fourth freedom which is the freedom of fear but the resultant consequence has been uh, the greatest threat uh, to the fourth foundational pillar of our constitution which is fraternity what is fraternity uh, fraternity literally means brotherhood and feminists rightly have a problem with the word but that can easily be addressed by saying we're talking about a, a shared brotherhood and sisterhood of all people. When uh, a teenage boy, Junaid, was uh, lynched uh, on a train uh, close to where I, I live in Delhi, uh, and everybody stood by and allowed it to happen, I visited his home. And after that, I wrote an article. And I started with the words, Junaid was my son. I did not know him when he was alive, but in the circumstances that he was killed, I, I mourn him like a son. I am an agnostic. His world was very different from mine. He was, he was studying to be an imam. He had become a hafiz. Hafiz is somebody who memorizes uh, the Quran. And yet he was my son. And I end the article by saying, he was also the son of those who were traveling with him on the train. He was also the son of those on that railway platform where they ejected him. And we went to that platform. Not one person, one hour, uh, was bleeding there and died on his, in his brother's lap. Not one person came to 
to rescue him, to protect, to give any assistance. And when we went there, I, I went to the station master, I went to all the shops, all of them said, we saw nothing, we saw nothing, we saw nothing. Except we saw, so one shop, small shop owned by a, uh, by a Muslim, when we went quietly, he said, what are they saying? The, the, the injured boys were lying right here for one hour and nobody came to help them. And so I wrote in my article, he was also the son of those who were on that railway platform and yet we let him die. To my mind, the idea of fraternity is that we belong to and with each other. There are many sibling ideas to the idea of, of fraternity. You can talk about solidarity, you can talk about caring, you can talk about empathy, you can talk about compassion, and we can talk about love. Dr. Ambedkar wrote a lot about fraternity. He said that even out of the four foundational principles of, of the Constitution, the most fundamental of them is fraternity. And he explained that justice, liberty and equality can never become the natural order of things unless there is fraternity. In what way are we equal? Why should I be concerned about the injustice faced by those four boys, uh, those eight uh, men in, in, in the Bhopal jail, or the 433 who have been killed in UP, or uh, 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 the Dalit boys who were, who were beaten up at Una, or Hafiz Junaid, uh, lynched to death in a train. I am concerned because they belong, I belong to them, they belong to me. We belong with each other. And it has to be the foundation both of social relations but also of public policy. And let me explain this. Uh, I am a very passionate believer in, in the principle of universal social protection. Uh, Noam Chomsky, a uh, well-known public intellectual was asked, what does social protection mean? And he said, social protection is ultimately the idea that we should take care of each other. The idea that we should take care of each other. I, I cannot think of a better definition, both of social protection, but also of the idea of fraternity. Uh, the Hindi word in the Hindi constitution, I, I searched what what have they called fraternity in, in, in the Hindi constitution? And it's a beautiful word actually. It's a word, the word they use is bandhuta. Bandhuta. From the Sanskrit, which literally means actually being bound together. Bandhuta could also mean an ideology of friendship. Uh, and Dr. Ambedkar reminded us that Without fraternity, justice, liberty, equality will remain ephemeral. And out of all the threats that this new leadership in India and across the world are posing, they are posing threats. And uh, again, let me not say, not the leadership is not posing those threats. We are posing those threats because we are electing and supporting and valorizing and adoring these leaders who stand for a set of values which threaten justice, liberty, equality, but most of all threaten fraternity. Um, in this context, I believed that we had to make some response. We had to make a response. I was troubled on the one hand by the intense normalized fear and hate with which minorities are teaching themselves to live with in India. But I'm worried equally or even more so by something else. And that is the silence of the rest of us. The silence of the majority community. The absence of articulation of outrage. Uh, there can be only three reasons, as I see it, for our silences. The first of them is that I am frightened to speak. 
And there is a sense of fear. I've already spoken about it. Uh, not just minorities, but people who speak out uh, boldly, strongly, uh, fearlessly uh, in solidarity with them. Uh, what happened to Gauri Lankesh is, is, is a reminder uh, of, of the fate. And so there is a sense of fear. So I may be silent because of fear. I may be silent because I don't care. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Dalit. Uh, how does it matter? But there's a third possible reason for my silence. And to my mind, that is the most dangerous of all. And that reason can be that in my heart, I actually carry those same sentiments of hatred. I won't act on them, but I'm happy to outsource to the lynch mob the acting out of my hate. And, and therefore, I felt very strongly that we needed to do, we need to do many things. One, on the one hand, a voice of atonement and solidarity with the minority community who is suffering and with Dalits. And the other is a call of conscience to the majority community, to the rest of us, to break our silences. And so, speaking you know, restlessly, especially after, you know, I went to Pehlu Khan's house, I went to Gunaid's house, uh, and after what I saw there, and I saw, had the conversation, I felt that we needed to do something. And so this idea came that, let, let, let us travel across the country and visit families who have been hit by hate violence and to say firstly that we seek your forgiveness on behalf of all of us for the country that we have made in which this violence, this hate has been possible. Uh, but along with forgiveness, the idea that we should say that you are not alone, that we care, that there are many people who care. And so this was the idea. And it was, it was just an idea uh, and it, it's one of the memories I'll carry through life because you know, once I decided we have to do this, I wrote an article in Indian Express with one paper which published it when I first made the call. Between that, that article and the time we set out was exactly just one month. Because I felt, we have to do it now. We didn't have a single rupee of, of resources. Nobody was willing to support it. A group of young people volunteered and came. Many of them I didn't even know. And they said, we, we, really, you know, we really want to join this. And you old fogies don't know how to communicate in, in today's era. And so they created a social media platform, which is a website, uh, crowdfunding. So we collected 20 lakh rupees uh, within a month. Uh, we talk, they said, what about an appeal? So I thought of a pledge. I said, normally we, we do a, you know, make a petition to somebody else, to the government. Let's make a petition to ourselves that I will not turn my face away from injustice. So we drafted a pledge and put it out. And within about three days, we got 20, 22,000 signatures, I think, uh, and so on. And, and then I said that along with, to travel with me, I'd like a few people who, are, who I described as chroniclers. So the important thing, if the, if it was the voice of solidarity was one thing, but the, the voice of conscience could only be when we tell the story. And that is why I'm telling the story here as well. That we must tell the story and it should not just be me, it should be many of us. And so uh, I was really delighted because people had to, within weeks, drop whatever they were doing and, and, and come in. Uh, there's one person here in the, in the audience, Vishnu at the back, who is in, uh, was, was a professor at the IIM in Trichy. So he wrote to me, I want to join. Uh, and he took leave and he joined. We had uh, writers, we had uh, uh, lawyers, we had uh, many different people, photographers, filmmakers, journalists. 
uh, why I know that that you know that the government officially leaned on people not to because from the media uh, news channels and, and newspapers uh, we had journalists who had, had got permission and said they would join but one or two days before it, it, uh, you know, we were to start they were told that all of them were told that they cannot their permissions were cancelled they were not to carry any stories the only two major mainstream uh, papers or houses that 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 defied this one of them was the indian express the other was ndtv and ndtv was quite lovely because we had these two young journalists and they made a uh, they stayed through the journey and they made a very beautiful film i would really recommend that you watch it they called it atonement and unusually uh, ndtv gave a full one hour slot for it uh, where they talked and in the commentary of the film i like very much because they start off by saying the karma did this the karma did that and towards the end they say we did this and we did that you know they they, they almost reflected unconsciously all of them you know this, this journey touched us in ways that that are hard to describe what did we see and we set off started off from assam we went from assam to dharkan dharkan to coastal karnataka karnataka we gathered again at delhi uh, tilak bihar uh, where the widows in 1984 then we went from there to western up to haryana to rajasthan to gujarat and concluded uh, at purbandar a few things that that we saw in the time that i have left firstly was the enormity of hatred that we saw uh it was just you know that junaid uh, akhlaq uh, and pehlu khan are just the tip of the tip of the iceberg this is happening all across not just the the extent to which hate violence is happening uh, targeted lynching and hate violence is happening but uh, the brutality of it So the first village we started off is Nagaon in uh, in in Assam, and I remember that there were these two teenage uh, cousins and close friends had gone out fishing to a neighboring village, and uh, suddenly this uh, rumor started that they were cow thieves, uh, and so they were lynched to death. But what their families especially could not come to terms with was was you know. the brutality with when they got the bodies back their eyes had been gouged out the ears had been cut off i mean for strangers to have this kind of hatred or when we were here in mangalore uh, a young man called harish pujari uh, was was lynched uh, and i when i remember writing at that time uh, i used to just write a note uh, every night a kind of an update uh, to people and i said is it really more tragic that he died because he was a hindu mistaken to be a muslim so this very personable young man his family when he when they found his body actually he had gone out with his friends and there were pictures of him one of them with his hands like this in a heart shape uh, which they saw only after he died and he had come home there was uh, no milk for his mother to make tea so he said i'll go, I'll go to the shop he'd gone to a shop he was returning and a muslim visibly muslim friend on a bike came and he said let me give you a lift and there was a 3 minute drive and this bajangal group accosted them and they attacked both of them and they lynched harish pujari with so much cruelty that they taken his intestines out now clearly he was a stranger I mean, he was not even a muslim that this crowd killed him with that kind of hate so so i think that we need to recognize and and once again i want to underline that to my mind what has happened in the political environment in our countries is is the legitimizing of the acting out of your hatred but these leaders have not created that hatred i think we need to recognize that 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 there were reservoirs of hatred in our soul which i at least had never recognized i never acknowledge so what in the permissive environment for hate that has been created what has happened is that they've been able to drill tube wells so deep into our souls that this hatred is now spouting out but it was there and we never dealt with it
Um, the second extraordinary thing that, that we saw through this caravan was, uh, was the use of the video camera. Every single episode, more or less, of lynching is filmed meticulously by the lyncher uh, and then uploaded. And one of the really horrifying stories, uh, again, I was in Jharkhand and uh, here, imagine that there's a middle class Muslim man who goes on his car and in the morning and an hour later, his son who is 16 years old receives a WhatsApp video and he opens the video and he finds it's a video depicting his father being lynched at that point of time uh, and uh, and he just can't so, uh, so what had happened was that his father was traveling to the main market and uh, suddenly this this amount of red meat you can see it in the video I mean this much of meat I don't know who would carry that kind of meat in, in, in their own car even if they were carrying it appeared and they said this is a cow that was killed and they uh, lunged into him they burnt his car and they started uh, beating him and then they were taking the video and you see him you know and people are laughing in the video and then uh, and, and you have him the humiliation of him begging and all of this and this is all videographed and then uploaded in real time and then his son sees this there was no one at home so he jumps onto a motorcycle trying to rush to save his father and then he has an accident because he didn't know how to drive and by the time the family reaches the man is dead uh, in many other places, we found these videos, and in uh, I think Destiny or Haryana, they were showing us. One person showed us actually their videos, which actually tell you how to lynch, their whole manuals uh, of, of, of of lynching, etc. It is seen as an act of public banner. Uh, when you when you videotape yourself lynching and then upload it, you're assured of your impunity. But most importantly, I think it is a it is intended as a message to the concerned community. Uh, you know, the one time in, in, in history elsewhere in the world where lynching was used as a, you know, uh, was against uh, black uh, African American slaves uh, in, uh, in the United States. And we are told, and I've been reading more and more about this, and those lynchings were public spectacles. They, you know, families were invited. The people had picnics while they watched the lynching happening. I believe with the video camera, we are actually restoring this idea of lynching as a public spectacle, as public entertainment. It's like a video game. It's like a reality show. But it's also a demonstration of the humiliation of a community, a public humiliation of the community as it begs uh, uh, for its life and it is not spared. Uh, we are increasingly seeing in every single of, we met about 55 families in these eight states, except in one, in every single one of them, the police was openly partisan. And what the police does is that it, it basically registers cases primarily against the victim. And we found extreme examples like if you are lynched uh, and two people have been killed uh, with transporting cattle, Police comes after five hours, they turn the vehicle over and then they say it was a case of cow smuggling, uh, cruelty to animals and rash and negligent driving as a result of which those two men died and the others are injured. And it's not even registered as a, as a case of lynching. Most of them are, these cases are not even making it into any kind of damage. So, the big cases we are hearing about how Junaid and Junaid's mother has been in touch with me and in fact she, she calls me on the third or fourth day and she was weeping. I went a few days ago. For 10, 10 minutes she just would not stop crying and she said that we are under so much pressure to compromise uh, you know, and, uh, and there is a Muslim Sarpanch and he said Bhai Chara ke liye, you know, as really we stormy word, Bhai Chara ke liye you should compromise, which means for brotherhood for peace, you should compromise by saying that the people who were, have been arrested uh, are all innocent. Uh, and uh, she's saying, I'm under so much pressure, but I, justice is, you know, has to happen. Uh, how will I you know, uh, face my son? Uh, and so on. Uh, 
we are also seeing increasingly examples of hate attacks now being executed by the police itself. So we are seeing growing numbers of encounter killings of the kind that I described in, uh, in Western UP and in Haryana and Mewat. Where now it's the police itself. Mewat is like, Haryana has actually created a uniform police cow protection force. Uh, it is a uniform police headed by a DIG or an IG. And they are doing the work of the mob or they work together. Uh, there's a sense of a zero expectation of justice. And that is what sort of has made my uh, soul, in a sense, get crushed all of watching all of this. Uh, the word that we heard over and over again was sabr. Sabr, I, mean, sabr kar liya hai. I, mean, I have learned to endure that they will not pursue your, your son has been lynched, your father has been lynched, your husband has been lynched but I will not even pursue case of legal justice because if I go to the police they will only register cases against me and harass me and the rest of the family and no justice is going to happen in any case uh, we were, I think Vishnu was also there uh, we visited this old man and I think it, it especially broke all our hearts because he uh, what had happened was that his son was lynched. The police did not show it as a lynching and quickly they buried the boy. Then there was some degree of local action by some youth, etc. And finally there was pressure that they needed to recognize that it was a lynching. So they exhumed the body. Now for the father, as an orthodox Muslim man, the, I, he kept saying, Kabar that he, he, you're only supposed to take out the body of your son on the day of judgment. He said, I agreed to the taking out of the body and the body was already decayed uh, so that the post-mortem could happen. But since then, nothing happened after that. He's not even got a copy of the post-mortem and the police has closed the case saying uh, they cannot find out who, was, who, who had killed him. And he was, you know, weeping away and he held my hand and he said that if you can at least get me a copy of the post-mortem report of my son and place it in my hand, you will go to heaven if I can see the post-mortem report of my son. Uh, there was an extraordinary difference in the way Dalits have responded because we visited a number of Dalit homes as well. Uh, where, where, they were, uh, where there was also violence during this period. A classic example is, is Shabirpur and the story was extraordinary again uh, using the word many times. The idea, you know, the, the, the Dalits had decided that they would set up one of those classic statues of Ambedkar with his hand pointing and with a constitution in one hand and pointing his finger. They, they bought the, the set, statue, they were about to set it up on their own land when uh, the government, uh, Adityanath's government came. And the Rajputs feel that they are now in power. And they said, Hamari Sarkar, it's our government. How will we tolerate the fact that Ambedkar is standing, pointing his finger on the street where we walk? And in response to that, they set fire to the entire Dalit Bhakti. But when we went to that place, we found that the Dalits there, the difference was, was striking because they were angry, uh, they were assertive, and they said, we will fight. Jebhim, uh, children, women, and uh, there was a mood that, that justice is still possible. This is still our country. With all the injustice, it is still our country. But with the minorities, even that sense uh, is getting lost. Uh, and worst of all uh, is the lack of compassion. The lack of local compassion, the lack of any kind of remorse, uh, again and again. Uh, give you one story. Usman Ansari is a story very similar to Akhlaq's. Uh, he, he was also a dairy farmer, one in, in Jharkhand, one house, Muslim house, and uh, so on. He, one of the, his cows died and he put it out for disposing and people spread the rumor that he had killed his cow. And the entire village came, they pulled him out, they set fire to his house, they, they took off his clothes, they, they pulped him. Uh, and and he was so terrified 
uh, and he was weeping. He didn't know what he'll do with the rest of his life. His children are now begging for more to more. He's in hiding. So when I, uh, I tried that we should, wherever possible, meet also the majority community. So this was one place where they said, yes, we'd organize a meeting of the majority community. I was very pleased. We went there. There were 500 people. But in a little while, people started giving speeches saying, hey, this was a small accident which we should forget about now. So I couldn't handle it after a while. I took the mic and I said, okay, it was your father whom your neighbors you know, pulp to death and strip him for nothing that he had done, burn his house. I'll come two months later and say it was a small accident, you should forget about it. Uh, if you're willing to forget it, then I'll ask him to forget it. So then they got more angry. They said, we thought you had come here for peace. So I said, yes, what is your definition of peace? So they said that you should, uh, he should give a statement, just like Dinesh's uh, family is being told, that all of those people who've been arrested are innocent. And uh, then we will ask him to come back. I said, if you really want uh, peace, then a delegation should go right from here, go and seek his forgiveness, welcome him back to the village, give him back his remaining cows, rebuild his house and ensure him of his protection. They said, the question doesn't arise. You are taking the side of the Muslims against the, the, the Hindus and so on. And there was much disruption. So there was no remorse. And that troubled me most of all. Gopal Gandhi actually wrote a very beautiful uh, article where he said uh, uh, we had one partition on the land uh, of India. Today we are seeing a partition of the hearts and minds. And I truly see this, I saw this everywhere when I travelled in this karma. This partition of the hearts and minds uh, and the contrast with, say, the, the people of the American, uh, of the United States and Trump is very telling. Within hours of the anti-Muslim country ban, uh, ordinary people had gathered at every airport, putting up signs saying, everyone is welcome here. Uh, I, I saw signs that we are all Muslims now. People went to their Muslim neighbors, knocked on the doors and said, don't feel frightened. Religious leaders spoke out. Uh, actors, uh, lawyers, uh, ordinary people, Germany after, in, in, generation after generation, they had at least tried to confront what happened uh, uh, at that time. Uh, I have a German friend, who is a professor, she's telling me that her 12-year-old son has, to, has a project where he has to uh, uh, find out, everyone in the class has to find out who, which Jews were killed in their vicinity and has to tell the story all at 12 years old so that people care and don't forget. I don't think in India we have to be we are even confronting uh, the collective hatred and violence that we are uh, culpable for with our silences. And, and therefore we resolve that we have to continue this karma in many different ways and we want everyone to join uh, metaphorically if not. We resolve that we will continue to travel to other states because people are telling us now come. So I, I recently was in Odisha. I was in West Bengal, uh, uh, Madhya Pradesh. People are saying this is happening. In Odisha, they were telling me that not a week goes past without some attack in the name of the cow. And they're saying that the extraordinary thing in Odisha is that everyone is taking credit for it. Sometimes the Youth Congress says we were the ones who did the attack. It wasn't the Bajran Dal. The, the Youth, Biju Janta Dal says, no, we attacked to protect the cow. Uh, you know, uh, and again, there are no progressive voices which are speaking out against it. Uh, Northern Bengal, they're saying, is, 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 is tearing apart again with these attacks. Uh, so I think that, you know, I can close by saying that in the battle for the preservation of constitutional values, we need to remember that it was we, the people of India, who gave ourselves these constitutions with these values, and it is ultimately for us to defend them. I don't see formal political parties uh, out there uh, to defend the idea of India as it is being unmade uh, every passing day. Uh, I have, you know, I'm opposed politically to the politics of Mr. Modi. Maybe if people make a coalition, maybe something happens, maybe he might even get defeated. To me, that is now not the central worry, you know. 
the central worry is is the we need to fight uh, political parties we need to fight uh, all political parties uh, for their various betrayals in this we need to uh, uh, fight the state we need to, need to fight the partisan police but i think most importantly we have to fight with ourselves we have to recognize that all of this is possible because of of the hatred and the silences uh, that we have nurtured because of the conversations we have not had with our young people because our fa- of our failure to speak out in support of uh, uh, of fraternity and upholding love and lastly when, you know, when we talked about love i which love am i speaking about and i really wanted to end remembering the last months of mahatma gandhi's life think of a time when you spoken all fought all your life for hindu muslim unity for hindu and muslims are like the two eyes my two eyes and a million people nothing less than a million people have died in hindu muslim riots in both sides my own family comes from rawalpindi we i've grown up hearing all the stories of what the muslims did to us etc train loads of people are coming on both sides uh, you know killed in the middle of this what was mahatma gandhi's last battle you know what we know about calcutta you know on the 40 days his fasting brought that city uh, finally to peace uh, lord mount bunsen said what 55000 armed soldiers could not do in punjab this one frail man did when he came to delhi and he was planning to go on into uh, you know with a jatha of uh, uh, hindus and sikhs from pakistan to go back and bringing back muslims from there that if he had lived he said he would have done that but but his last battle was actually people tell us that in in delhi all the mosques you know these refugees had come with so much anger hindu and sikh refugees they taken over over the mosques the mehroli mosque or the delhi mosque the adargas had all had been converted into temples and they had gone and attacked uh, all the muslim settlements given them out and occupied their homes and mahatma gandhi's last battle in that time was to say that that hinduism would mo- lose its meaning if a single mosque has been forcefully occupied and converted and i want every mosque to be returned and i want every uh you know every muslim home to be returned to the muslims bring them back from the relief camp and go back yourself to the relief camp he had the power the moral power to make that demand and it was finally people accepted it and that is why the mosques have been returned to the muslims that is why so many muslims have been, have stayed on in india today uh, regarding he said he said the soul of india will be emptied out if muslims cannot live here uh, without fear with their heads held high with their hearts free of fear so it is that love that i am talking about when we talk about a caravan of love i'm talking about the love which is founded on absolute fearlessness on absolute conviction and we're not going to get a leader who is going to lead us in the way that mahatma gandhi did i think we have to find uh, that gandhi within each of ourselves otherwise india will be unmade uh, and i i i i uh, i feel frightened to think about what country we will give to our children thank you